Uh, so welcome to the Open Government Hack Night Divi Data Edition. Uh, just out of curiosity, how many people came to the first Divi Data Hack Night that we had back in was it June or July? May. May. Raise your hands. I was there. Maybe I should. Uh, do you guys know what Divi is? <laughs> uh, so this is a Open Government Hack Night. We've been, uh, we meet here every Tuesday at six o'clock to talk about. Uh, open data, uh, civic technology, and actually learning how to work with that data and tools to build civic apps. Uh, I'm with a group called Open City. And my name is Derek Eager. Uh, and we have been hosting this thing since uh, March of 2012, something like that. Uh, so tonight uh, is kind of a little bit of a uh, not this typical Open Gov hack net. We're going to have uh, a little bit more heavy on the presentation side, but as always, we break out afterwards and go to the rest of the 1871 space and either work on projects or actually we've been trying uh, in the last few uh, uh, weeks is uh, having some sessions on teaching people how to program, uh, first time or introduction to programming. Uh, and then Christopher Whitaker, our man here in the jacket with the camera, uh, gives a Open Gov 101 uh, session sort of for people who are new to this concept of Open Gov and Open um, also, a note on the camera, we do record these. The Smart Chicago Collaborative puts it up on their blog, uh, smartchicagocollaborative.org, uh, and it's an SMART kind of every thing that we've had. Um, so, uh, before we dive into the presentation part, uh, we have a couple of uh, uh, little agenda items that we usually go through. One is uh, everybody, there's a lot of us, but we can get through it. Everybody uh, introduces themselves and just gives a quick little note uh, about why they're here and what they're just doing. Um, the point is to sort of meet people who are interested in this stuff and to sort of make new connections, and so that's really honestly one of the best ways to figure that out. Uh, so we'll start with that, and then we'll have some announcements, and then we'll get into the main event. Uh, so I'll start again. I'm Derek Eater, mixed up with open data. Uh, all those I'm Elliot Greenberger. I'm the general manager of PV, and I'm excited to be here. I'm uh, Sean Whitehead with Chicago Department of Transportation, and I'm here because Elliot made me come. <laughs> Charles Zane, the developer of Creative Health. My first time here. Very interested in learning more. Uh, Miguel, background in finance and neuroscience, and I'm interested in visual. Um, I'm Lynn. I work at a high school. I'm Christina Arthur. I work for CTA, and I'm interested in computer. My name is Daniel Ronan. I'm interested in active transportation and historic preservation. I'm Jackie, I'm a physician and tour consultant. I'm Sean Jacobson, and I just got kind of started making maps and stuff, so I'm interested in how this is going to do that too. I'm um, Colin Kiko, I work at UIC in business and financial systems, and just want to request a I'm Nicole, I work in product development at an IT firm, and just interested in the Nikki data. Uh, I'm Nick. I work in uh, Child Welfare and Education Policy at uh, Chapman Hall. Uh, my name is Tom. I'm the Director of Analytics for the City of Chicago. I run the uh, Open Data Portal and the Main City. I'm Megan Sullivan. I'm a Quality Assurance Engineer and a Copywriter. Uh, my name is Ryan, developer here in the city. Uh, I get this email like every week, and this one sounded intriguing to me, so I'm here. <laughs> I'm in the room back here. <laughs> My name is Renee, and I'm here observing and uh, giving tips, giving up tips on programming. I'm Teresa. I'm an interaction designer at Reputech, and I'm just into open data, data visualizations. I'm Jared, and I'm uh, learning how to use Python with data. <coughs> uh, my name is Greg. Everybody, um, I'm a designer slash developer here, and I'm interested in uh, Divi data. I'm John. I uh, work for CTA. Um, I'm interested in digital data and maybe how it relates to transit fire providers. Uh, my name is also John. I'm a developer here in Chicago, avid biker, and uh, like everybody here, interested in Divi. Um, my name is Mickey. I uh, am an intern at WBEZ, um, a radio station, and uh, I'm here to learn more about the highlights and um, guest bicycles. <laughs> Um, my name is Eugene, I work in finance. Um, I guess I'm interested in data citizens. 
<laughs> My name is Marty Malone. I'm a um, project coordinator at UI Labs. Kyle Schaefer, I built software for the PC and also in Canada. I'm David Altenberg, and uh, I've been working on uh, an app to visualize the um, I'm Kyle Johnson. I'm, you know, I've been following this stuff for a while. I'm kind of important. Cool. I'm Terry. I'm uh, interested in um, housing and uh, how the open government uh, data portals can work with people finding out more about their rights in their neighborhoods. I'm Marcus. Uh, I work in data for a university, and uh, I'm here because Terry invited me. <laughs> My name is Justin Lozier. I'm a data analyst slash software engineer, product optimization specialist at Red Hook. And I'm here because so my friend Andrew and I are collecting digging data. Every minute of digging data works past five minutes or something. So it looks like I'll some data make really interesting to have that. <coughs> My name is Stephen Vance. I'm a transportation reporter for Streets Blog Chicago, and I'm going to be your host tonight for Divi Data 2. <laughs> I'm Nick. I'm a programmer. I'm here to help people get into new programming, get over the hump. Hope it is. Hi, I'm Kathy. I'm a consultant with a background in math, and I'm here because I want to see how to play around with the Hi, I'm Scott. I'm a software developer here and uh, a Divi member and uh, more interested in Divi data. I'm Liz. I'm an actuary and a predictive modeler, so I love data. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Claire. I'm a UX designer and I love to ride my bike, so this is a good combination of those two things. I'm Josh Billions. I'm a partner of product development consultant in Chicago and CTO for Pikespot. I'm just interested in building some hardware appliances around biblical data. I'm Casey. I'm in insurance, and this is my second meeting in a row. Uh, and that sounds pretty good, too. <laughs> and I like riding my bike. Steve Edgar. I'm at the Latin School and <clears throat> database administrator. And uh, I'm looking for. Um, anybody's favorite application for project management, especially in the Mac environment. Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> Just making sure. I'm uh, Joe Yakabuchi with Sam Schwartz Engineering. Um, uh, I had presented here actually about six months ago on, on housing and transit usage. And um, uh, I have an ongoing interest with open data and how, how it interacts with uh, built environment and, and Hi, I'm Jessica Teji. I just joined a startup called Swift IQ that is on <clears throat> big data and APIs. So I thought this would be a great way um, to get to know Divi Data and see how it could help. Um, I'm Chris. I work at an econ consulting firm. I'm really excited to join whatever project I can here. Uh, my name is Christopher. I am the brigade captain for Chicago for Code for America. And I'm also a consultant at the Smart Chicago Collaborative. My name is John. Uh, I work with Geographic Information Systems. Uh, my name is Warren. I'm a database administrator. Uh, I'm Javad, and I'm a developer at Drug Club. And um, I have a Ruby Gem. I work on a Ruby Gem to make it easy to uh, import uh, data with Ruby into Neo4j graph databases. So if you have any questions, you can talk to me. Uh, I'm Nick. I'm a programmer and a map maker. I'm Eve. I'm a youth program developer and um, childhood studies researcher and co-founder of Freedom Games. I'm Ada. I design um, educational games and user interfaces. Um, I'm also a co-founder and lead designer at Freedom Games. <coughs> I'm James. I have a background in math. I work at Branchfire as a QA guy. Uh, big for cluster analysis. Yeah. Uh, anybody else we miss? There's a few people back there. Uh, Rob. I'm, I'm Rob Carroll. I'm a consultant. Cool. Great. Anyone you want to say hi? Hi. I'm one of the organizers. Sorry. And you're late. Great. That's awesome. Uh, a lot of really uh, cool, different <laughs> backgrounds here. So it's typically the case here in Hackman, which is more about using what you do.
so uh, before we get to the presentation, we'll have a quick sort of open floor for announcements. If you have events that are coming up or uh, a project that you'd like to mention, uh, I've got one, but I'll save it at the end. Christopher, you always ask. Um, so part of what we're trying to do is help match meet people who are interested in working on projects. We actually have a civic hacker census up. If you go to bit.ly slash Chicago Civic Hacker, it's written on the board. Um, there'll be a sort of questions asking, you know, what are your interests and what are your skills and what would you like to get involved in? Once we get a, sort of everybody's information, we can start matchmaking and getting helping to gather people together for uh, projects. Yeah. So the idea behind that is to sort of uh, augment this page, which is uh, on the OpenVelope Hackmate website. Uh, this is pulling data from GitHub, uh, and it's very biased towards people who use GitHub. Uh, <laughs> so we'd like to add everybody else who has skills that don't necessarily equate to like, committing lines of code. Uh, and so that's the sort of point behind the survey. So the idea is to, as we build up this list of people, we'll add it to this, and we'll have a more sort of view of, of the people who come to this event every week and are in this week. Uh, other events? Or, uh, so this past week, the city of Chicago released their OpenGov uh, report, <laughs> Open Data Report. This is our novel report that we released this. Uh, it's an extension of an executive order that was signed by Ron Emanuel last December. Uh, and every, Jan every July, from this point on out, we're going to be releasing this report that describes uh, one key initiatives that we're going to be engaging in with our open data portal, and two, to give you a preview of data sets that we want to work with, work on for the upcoming year. Uh, the URL for it is report.cchicago.org slash open dash data dash or you can go through GitHub. Yeah. 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 It's a new report. It, it is a new report, yeah. So uh, we, we, go, we step through a number of key initiatives that we're going to be taking a look at. And one, so a lot of what folks on the key initiatives that we have in the reports up there is uh, better outreach, better feedback, uh, better engagement with the developers in the sense of when we want to change technical things such as API names. You know, we, we need to alert people of that. There's, there's few mistakes that we know that exist out there. We want to do a better job. We want to publish more of the, the uh, top requested uh, FOIA requests. So we're working on text mining algorithms to identify that by looking at all the FOIA requests that have been posted online. Juan, I hope you like that, because we've taken the FOIA data sets that were posted that you hated, and maybe I should turn those into a useful thing. Uh, uh, when new systems are going to get secured, we want to identify right up front what data from those systems should be released, as opposed to what my team ends up doing a lot, is trying to chase down data from systems that have just been built. Uh, we want to improve our collaboration with the county and the data sets that they have, because the city and county have very distinct <coughs> operations. But with some other open data portal websites, they have the advantage of a city might run the hospitals, so you get, you get richer data on various different aspects. Uh, and then also uh, 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 better opportunity to get feedback from you in terms of data sets that you want to see. You can go to the data portal right now. You can email us of data sets that you want to see, but that's via email. That's, that's not the way that we do things. <coughs> so we want to make this a bit more automated, a bit more transparent. On some key data sets that we're hoping to release in this upcoming year, uh, we're hoping to release uh, almost all of the 311 calls in the upcoming year. Uh, we're also looking forward to releasing uh, ordinance violations, various different bits of ordinance violations that exist. So you actually, on the portal, you can see a lot of tickets that have been written, but you may not know what the outcome of those tickets were. And was there a, a fine actually levied? How much was that fine? Or was the case entirely dismissed? We want to reveal that information as well. And then uh, a number of data sets from a variety of different departments uh, that that really didn't make the large bullet, bullet, bullet list, but after we talked to them, they said, well, this is important to our day-to-day -day operations, and so we want to make that information available to them. This isn't definitive. This isn't exclusive. So there will be other data sets besides uh, what we've listed up on this report, um, but uh, it is something that we are going to be targeting over the next six months to a year. Uh, before we get to the next announcement, there are one, two, three, four, five, six different open seats here. So if people who are out in the hallway would like to be brave and sit in front, please come in. Uh, uh,
I mean, tell us about these open data coordinators. So the open data coordinators is part of the executive order, uh, something called the open data uh, uh, advisory group, which is comprised of open data coordinators, uh, were created. So every single operational department, by operational department, I, I, I should clarify it being a within the core city services. We have a number of sister agencies, such as CPS, such as CTA. Those are not under the scope of this executive order. So these open data coordinators are those who advise on creating this report. So oftentimes we reached out to them and said, uh, looking for data sets that should be released, data sets that they think would be very valuable to the public, or very valuable to themselves by making it available to the public, because it tells a lot about what their agency does. So this group here will remain fairly static. It's uh, over time, and we'll consult and advise on creating this report every single year. This is pretty unique, by the way. The, the city passed an executive order to kind of make open data law in the city of Chicago. And one of the big key things was actually getting this expertise spread out throughout the department. So it's not just on in, in the Department of Innovation Technology right here, but you kind of have embedded people everywhere, and that's going to hopefully sustain this stuff through time. Um, uh, I have an announcement. We have uh, guests from the Chicago and Developers Group tonight. Uh, I'm going to let Molly tell you a little more about Okay. Uh, we are a networking group for women in technology, and we want to support women in technology. All of our meetings are open to everybody. Uh, we meet in the same place, sometimes in the same room, usually on Thursday evenings for an open, open half night. Um, everybody is welcome to come attend that. Who's here from Chicago Women Developers? I recognize some of you. Woo! Great. <laughs> Other announcements? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> it's sort of in the same meetup vein. Um, my name is Daniel Ronan. I started a group for LGBTQA identified. Uh, well, A is like. Allies, so everyone's welcome. But um, <laughs> urban um, folks that work in urban policy and planning, and we're looking for people, not just planners, but everybody who works in education, environment, law, policy, and any sort. So if you're interested in that, you can. Um, it's actually called Moxie. Moxie. Yeah. Moxie Moms. Not. <laughs> 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 no, no, no. Google. So like, you know, it's a new group. It's a new group. It's rising to the top. So uh, be sure to uh, be sure to look, check that out, and I'm here to point. Moxie makes your fan. Oh yeah, that's our that's our fan. Now we all have to be alliteration. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <that's great. laughs> uh, other announcements? Yeah. Uh, Nicole, I am hosting the International Space Apps Challenge oh. this year. So if anyone, I don't know if you're familiar with it, it's uh, NASA defines a set of challenges focused on um, tackling problems on and off Earth. That's the website. It's not updated yet, but soon it will be, and you'll be able to sign up to attend in Chicago. So if anyone's interested in getting involved in volunteering, you should come talk to me. I'm be talking. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Other announcements? Hi, I'm Christine Arthur. Um, I'm a committee member of Transport Chicago, which is a conference held annually. It's a homegrown conference where we bring together transportation professionals and academics. Um, we have a call for papers out right now um, that are, I think the deadline is in early March, so I just wanted to let everyone know about that. Um, if you have any questions about the conference, you can see me and I can see more information. What kind of papers do they have to be? Uh, we're looking for papers that are related to uh, urban planning and transportation planning. So anything from freight to <coughs> transit planning. Um, we have some presenters, forward presenters. Uh, Steve Nance was a presenter last week. I'm presented on iCrash analysis. Did you actually write a paper? Okay. <laughs> uh, I collaborated with a student on a paper, and then he flew up to Italy and I gave the talk. <laughs> <laughs> so get someone else to do the writing. <laughs> <coughs> Other announcements? Yeah. Okay, so uh, a few weeks ago I made a talk about uh, GeoKit, uh, and someone had this really interesting question. He asked what would happen uh, if GitHub, a major company in this space, <laughs> were to create a better visualization. Do we have a person who's asked that question here today? Does anyone know who it was? I don't remember. I don't remember, but that person 
I'm taking him to Vegas someday because <laughs> last week GitHub comes out with this whole production. I don't think the first one works, so uh, GitHub still has some issues. Everything I show okay. you still doesn't like actually work still on GitHub, <laughs> but there are exceptions. There are ways that you can see these things on GitHub well, where you'll be able to see things that have been added, removed, deleted just by putting data into GitHub. It's really for everyone who isn't like a GIS professional. Like if you're thinking, if you're interested in GitHub and you're in, if you're interested in map data that changes, just put it into GitHub and you'll see really interesting uh, visualizations like this that show like how data changes over time. Um, uh, it's not really working, but Steve is gonna go through it later. Yeah. <laughs> Essentially, it shows you change over time. So yeah, there you go. There you go. That's a good one. This, what this says is from this version of this file of hidden stations. What's been removed and what's been added from the previous version. So red stuff has been removed and green stuff has been added. In theory, you can kind of flip through them to see how things are changing over time. It's a way for us to kind of do what's called version control, which is what you do whenever you have MS DOS, right? And you say like, this is version one of my essay. <laughs> the same thing except for uh, for geodata. <laughs> but you don't actually need to know that information to use this. Just if you keep putting versions of your data into GitHub, it'll create this kind of like visualization for you, which is a huge help. Cool. Uh, other announcements? Yeah, Maynard. I might as well uh, do one last one. Uh, so uh, with a couple of folks you know, sort of in this community, like have, have been, have, uh, I organized a group called uh, the Data Potluck. And so we recently kind of restarted these meetings. They happen about monthly. Uh, and uh, the way that we're doing it now has a very strong training focus. Uh, so as of <laughs> now, I'll never fit into that suit again. Uh, uh, great. Uh, so so uh, our, our next oh, our meetup. Com, we have an extensive web presence. Uh, we're on meetup.com for under data potluck. Uh, but we're going to be meeting at the Chicago Community Trust next Wednesday. Uh, from 6 o'clock until 9.30. Uh, we're going to have three breakout sessions. Uh, it's going to be in Excel, so please invite uh, well yourselves and all of your nonprofit buddies uh, in uh, data visualization with Matt Plot Lynn, uh, and also a uh, uh, breakout session on Pentaho. It's all going to be mob programs, which means that we're going to bring along like a representative problem. Uh, we're going to have, I don't know, 15-ish people in the room, and we're going to pass the keyboard at every like five to ten minutes, so that everybody can like work on the problem and kind of do it together and like very hands-on. So it's it's kind of like data science training, um, but uh, you know, with all applied problems, uh, it will happen. Uh, I got one. Uh, so there's a little website we made uh, called Clear Streets that track. I got to spell it. Okay, thank you. Got it. Nailed it. All right, great. So this is uh, a website that tracks where the clouds go whenever it snows. Um, and actually, over I think if you guys were watching Channel Five uh, on I believe it was Wednesday, they used some of our data to back up a story. They basically got the tip that someone in someone's street uh, they claimed had never been plowed all winter. And uh, I was like, well, oh, that's fascinating. I didn't think that really happened ever. So I looked at the data that we had been screaming from the city's website for the past uh, eight major storms and used that data. And this site does not work super great on normal browsers. But uh, <laughs> uh, all right, you have to see yourselves your app. So uh, anyways, uh, I took some of this data to sort of try to back up this story. Has, has a plow actually gone down this one street on the 4600 block of North Kelso? And it turns out the data actually supported their claims. Oh, and they <laughs> took their TV crew out there, and they shot it. And they're like, yeah, look, we can't get around on our street. Uh, so it's kind of like, it's actually a pretty awesome uh, combination of them doing their NBC5 investigate story and then actually using some, some data to help tell that story, which is actually not something they typically do, uh, this kind of data analysis. <laughs> they did it. Obviously, they check all their sources, but doing like big data sort of stuff is not uh, really, uh, it's kind of weird. So it's kind of exciting to be able to help them kind of learn uh, how some of this stuff works. So You should definitely watch the, the story. It's fucking hilarious. They're like, breaking news. We found a street that hasn't been flat. Like, so yeah, I mean, so, you know, it's very sensationalistic, but uh, you know, I guess my my take on this whole scenario is that what I found 
found tracking these plows over the last three years is that overall the city does an awesome job. I mean, you literally like go to sleep and like people are driving in trucks by your streets while you're like in the middle of bed at night, all snug. And they cover most of the city really, really well. It's just in certain circumstances we found that in this one particular example, they meant the street got missed. So I'm kind of thinking about now. Can we use our data to help the city identify other streets that haven't been hit uh, by a plow? Um, so if people want to talk about that, I'll be thinking about that uh, uh, later on uh, as we break down. Um, OK, so with that, I believe we'll get into the main event. We had a lot more events. So I'll turn it over. Wait, oh. <laughs> uh, I'll turn it over to our MC, Stephen Vance, uh, and give us a big one. So uh, if you have a computer tonight and you want to follow along, this is all the resources that you prepared ahead of time, although uh, like 20% of you have said at some point that you either ride a bike or have already started developing something or you're going to develop something. And so I expect you to add those in as I'm talking. And so the link is uh, j.mp, capital Divi, capital Hackpad. It's a, a wiki style uh, website. Uh, so I'm, we're just going to run. Oh, I guess I should talk about why we're doing this the second time. So Divi, we had a Divi Data Day uh, in June last year. Elliot was here. Uh, another uh, one of his coworkers, Dan Golke, was here. Dan uh, works for the parent company. He kind of traveled around the country helping the other bike share systems set up around the country, and he was kind of their data expert. So he was kind of helping us get us jump started on understanding the data. And also, uh, and so now we want to do it again, because Divi has been around since June 28th or 9th. Yeah. And, um, and it's going to get bigger. Uh, so I'm going to let Elliot and Sean talk more about Divi as a system, as a, as a transportation system and also what data is available. And then after that, we're going to show some apps and visualizations that some people have already created. And then we'll we have more after that. Hi. Uh, so I'm Ellie Greenberger. I work at Divi. I'm the general manager. And I'm here with Sean. And I'm Sean Waddell. I'm the assistant commissioner at CDOT. And I'm the program manager on the city side for Divi. So I'm from the operator, and we work together on, on Divi. Um, first of all, really excited to be here. I recognize some of you from Twitter, actually. It's kind of seeing your face like this big. Um, so it's good to see your face in the flesh. But uh, neither Sean nor I, the bad news is we're not really technologists. But the good news is that um, we're really open. And actually, I, I don't want to give you credit for this, but the whole release of the data was, we were always planning on doing it, but sometimes we just need a little we were poked. Yeah, poked. we were poked in the best I, possible I way. <laughs> and you said, you want to do this event? Um, and we thought, well, that's the perfect timing to release the data. So that's all to say that we're really open. Um, we want to get your feedback tonight. Find us afterwards if you don't get any questions in. Um, tell us what you want to see, because we want to spend our time on things that are going to be useful to you guys. Um, and then we'll relay that back to our team. So um, apologies that we're not you know, the most data scientific ourselves, but we do have the right spirit in mind, hopefully. Um, and when Elliot says, refer back to my team, all of that means the voices in my head for me, because I am my team. <laughs> Sean's a one man. I'm the, I'm the only one at CDOT working. I've got lots of help, but I'm the only one working. Yeah. Um, how many people are Divi members? Awesome. How many people have written Divi? Okay. Um, so most of you know what Divi is. How many people are compulsive about it? How many people are <laughs> Divi addicts? How many people <laughs> signed up for Divi Brags when Divi Brags was available to track Divi trips? Brags? Okay. So that was another thing. It's like trip tracker. Yeah, Divi Brags is this app that um, <laughs> created where you can basically track your own trips and see how many miles and charted and all that. Um, that was, again, something that someone came to us with, and we didn't really have the resources. We don't have an API at the moment, but we worked with him to make sure that it was secure and safe. That was basically our number one concern. We don't want to make sure, we don't want people giving away their passwords. So, you know, if you have an idea and you want to come to us, we're more than happy to work with you. Uh, so, Divi launched June 28th. 
uh, 300 stations. We finished our third number, 300 station on October 29th. 29th. Yeah, it took forever. It took a long time, uh, but over the summer we, we expanded up to 300. Uh, we're continuing to operate over the winter, most of you know, and we're going to hopefully expand uh, very shortly to 175 more stations, to 475 stations. Um, Sean is the person responsible for uh, leading the siting team, so figuring out exactly where all the stations go. And maybe you can talk a little sure. bit about Yeah, so we, uh, as Ellie mentioned, we have a really great collaborative relationship, as you can tell, a little bit of self-deprecation, and um, have, we have fun working together. Um, but we are expanding Divi this year. We've got a couple different things. We actually have three different approaches. So we, of course, in Chicago, there's no way to get around politics. So we've met with all the aldermen uh, where we're going to be expanding <coughs> Divi to get their suggestions on where Divi stations might go. More importantly, I would argue, but don't, well, you can post this anyway. So <laughs> I will be quoted on it. But uh, more importantly, uh, we are actually uh, doing pop-up meetings. So we're actually out in the communities where we're going to be expanding this year, uh, working with existing venues and existing groups like farmers markets or community meetings or CAPS meetings, and actually getting people's input on where they'd like to see Divi stations. <coughs> And then finally, um, we've got a, a website, which I'm sure most of you have seen, which is yes, that divibikes.com right there, um, where anyone can make suggestions uh, for a station. You can also support, make comments on um, any of the station locations and ideas. And we, so we actually are using all that information to uh, find, to figure out what the best station locations are. We're going to be expanding in all directions this year. Uh, we're going to be adding 175 stations, as Elliot mentioned. Uh, about 25% of those are infill. So we've actually zoomed back in. You can actually see, like, in down some of the downtown, you can actually see right here. There's a gap right there. That's Queen's Landing, I think. Um, but there's some gaps that we need to fill. So we're going to be filling about 25% of the stations that will be in those gaps. And then we're going to be expanding down to about 79th on the south. Probably get to about two year Howard on the north, and then west to we're actually west to Kedzie, but actually filling in more to Kedzie, except it kind of hugs in a little bit closer along the shore. We're using all that data that we collect from this website, plus in person data uh, for both Altman and also uh, in in the communities to really put that together, come up with an idea of where stations should go. And then we actually sit in a room and we actually use Street View do our first analysis. We actually look at dots on a, we put dots on a map, we use street view to, to then investigate where it makes sense, and then we actually go out and field and visit those and figure out the final locations. Real um, quick, yeah. Um, this software it's being used is something called ShareAbouts, which is made by an awesome uh, the government uh, software development shop in Europe oh, plans. plans. And they worked with CDOT to come up with this basically a uh, way of, of crowdsourcing, crowd planning the system. Mm. And if you're in share for any number of other applications, it's open source, you can use it for free, you can stand it up if you have a programmer, and I think they're making it so you kind of create your own value for it. So share for anyone who's interested in this kind of crowdfunding stuff. Someone suggested a station in the middle of the future. Yes, we had a couple. And, it, and you'll also see if you look at the map, there are stations in Naperville, there's stations in Oak Lawn, uh, Westmont, or Dunworth Lake. No care for it. We will. We'll consider despite it. it being in Chicago now. Despite, <laughs> despite the fact that it's in the city of Chicago, technically, there will never be any station. Just you can see, you can put them wherever you want. We reserve the right to stop at the city border in this particular case. Although actually, we put in a grant application with Oak Park and Evanston a couple months ago. Um, we should here actually in the next month or so to actually expand into those suburbs. We're being strategic though. As you can see, we've started. We started here in the center. We're growing outwards, and we're going to continue to do that. We can't hop out to Naperville out here um, because just the, to serve that doesn't make sense at this point. So we're trying to grow out from the center. We're willing to work with suburbs. We're willing to actually go out into those communities. We don't know exactly what the revenue sharing model would be or how that would work, but we're still figuring out and, and interested. But the less dense your, your urban area, the harder it is to do bike share. Right. Because for it to be useful, it needs to be close to stuff. And if everything's really spread out, that means you have to have 10 times as many stations, which breaks the thing. And then and on that point, in downtown, we're probably, stations are one to two blocks apart at the most, in general. 
Um, there's some, there are gaps, like I mentioned, but then as you get out, out into neighborhoods, it's, they're usually about three to four blocks apart. But um, that's kind of the standard that we're working with. One of the cool things about bike share is that the stations are modular, <coughs> which you may have noticed. So we've actually, you know, we started with these stations, but sometimes we'll notice, especially downtown during rush hour, stations get full really quickly in the morning, they empty out really quickly at night. And so instead of adding a whole new station, sometimes all we need to do is just add more plates to it. Those you know four docks at a time, which we've done uh, on Daily Center Plaza. Daily Center Plaza is now started at 25 and is now 45. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that's cool, and that's how we use the data too in real time and seeing what gets full and what gets empty. Because again, the way the bike share works is you, know, you want to you always want to make sure a bike's available to take, and you also want to make sure a dock's available to return your bike. Sort of a basic thing. So we're always looking at full stations and empty stations and how often that happens. So you can sort of adjust them fly. And we have that actually, the full and empty is one of the standards. So we have, we have a great working relationship, but we also have performance standards that maybe the Alta team actually need to meet. And so that's one of the things we use for judging. And they actually, if they do better, we as we make profit, they actually make they actually get more of the profit. We right now the city's taking more risks, so we get more of the profit, but then as we advance in the years in the contract, they actually get more of a profit based on their performance and meeting meeting or exceeding the standards that we've set. So the data that was available for today uh, was primarily located at divibikes.com slash station slash JSON. It's a JSON feed. Um, and you could get uh, all of the station locations, the last two months to the station name, and then the number of docks, and the real-time information on how many bikes are available and how many docks are available. Um, and that's what powers our app. It's called Cycle Finder. Uh, but there are a lot of people. Anyone can use this data. So you integrate it into your app. Um, did anyone else integrate into their app? Well, I'm scraping it up a minute. <coughs> You guys started. You and like so, 10 other people. <laughs> we're trying to like uh, get you all together because there's probably a lot of duplicative work and the, the text file is like one and a half gigabytes or more for all of that. Yeah. At least yeah, the ones I've seen. Yeah, gigabytes. So it's a lot of uh, computers that are working that don't need to be working. So what you see here is every one of these bundles is an actual station. <coughs> and it's almost like I wrote a spreadsheet where this tells you the column name and this tells you the value. So Station, of this station, the station name is State in Harrison. The uh, city doesn't exist, apparently. Uh, <laughs> the current number of bytes right now is 11. And the latitude of the stations, you can map it is. And the way this actually gets to this website is, say that I come in with my bike and I dock it. Then that minute, it's going to say there is one bike out of three total slots. And that's the, those are the values you see there. Every minute, this actually uses the cellular network. The broadcast, uh, like, it goes from each station to the server that's feeding that data. Like, mm -hmm. okay. uh, and then it shows up here, and that page will refresh every minute. And the only thing that really changes is the number of bytes that are available uh, every minute. Does that make sense? Does anyone want to mention how they've used it for their app? <laughs> or? Yeah. Um, I helped I help Alex a little bit with his city regs. Um, he was looking at what are the distances between stations, which is what is the distance between my bike. And he was hitting Google Maps API every time, which is a lot of calls for every, every person. Um, so I took this whole station list and I found every distance between every pair of stations and gave that to him in a stack file. So just cache, instead of having to make all these calls, you have 90,000 possible distances there. You know, you don't need to call them at the time the stations are moving around. So, mm -hmm. okay. um, oh, it's already in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll be showing an example of like some of the DC stuff. Okay. They start doing like pretty. Mm -hmm. Not tomorrow, but like. They record all the data. So they're scraping the data every minute of every day since the beginning of the day. And then they're able to find patterns and say, well, the bike share station would probably have this many bikes available in 10 minutes and 15 minutes. 
that was a little bit like something we did for Divi last summer. Yeah. Um, so this is something that the data science was also with fellowship did last summer, uh, where you know a bunch of people took this data. We actually did it for DC, even though we say we did it for Divi because there was more data. And what we were trying to basically figure out is for each station in Life Share, the, the pattern tends to look like this. So if you're a residential station or an outlying station, in the morning you have a lot of bikes, and then uh, as people grab them to go on their commute, you can run out. And the opposite happens downtown because people are moving downtown, so the docks start to get really full, and sometimes they get totally full. And so what you're trying to do is kind of predict this pattern for every station every day, every hour actually, or every five minutes, given the current weather, the current, all these things. And so you just want to predict. We're here right now. Where are we going to be in an hour? That way you know, or you're, we're here right now. Are we going to be empty in an hour? And that way you could have the dispatchers go and, pre and pre prevent the outage to be um, So that's another of the kind of application you can do. Yeah, and just to clarify that, um, we have <coughs> vans circling the city. Probably a lot of you have seen big blue vans. And if you know what they're doing, great. If you wonder what they're doing, I'll tell you right now. They, uh, between 6 AM and midnight, they are shuffling bikes around. So we call them rebalancers. They're moving bikes from stations that are full or approaching full and actually moving them to stations that are empty or approaching empty. And again, we want to avoid being full or empty stations. Uh, you know, it seems a little clunky, but at, at this point, it's the best solution we have to. to we do that mostly during rush hour. Yeah, at the beginning and the end of the day, neighborhoods actually tend to more organically, when you get out more in the perimeter, they tend to more organically move the bikes. People move the bikes around for us. Yeah. But in the downtown area, in the central business district, there's a lot of rebalancing going on every day. This is literally what they look at. It's a list of which stations have been are currently <laughs> right now and you're full, and how many minutes they've been in full. So if you can do better than this, then you're, you're already helping. Yeah. Admittedly, it's there's a lot, lot of room for. I mean, this is yeah. fine, right? It tells you what the what the problem, what the, where the fires are, but ideally, you'd like to know when they're about to spark. Absolutely. Does anyone have any questions, or did you want to move on to yeah. give them on? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Another question. Well, time for questions? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any time. Um, okay. So we have three uh, presenters. We're going to show off uh, apps that they've already made using the data that. Elliot just talked about. Um, let's go with Fiddy first. So Fiddy, so this is David Altenberg. Um, it's online right now. Hey, what's up? Okay. I don't know if the graphs look good. Don't, please don't all do this. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so tell us what Biddy does. OK, so I am one of those people who have been grabbing the um, dock and bike availability data every minute. And I've got this all in a Postgres database. And this, Biddy, which I need to change the name because there's apparently a, some video sharing web app or <laughs> site that uses that. So I, Open for suggestions. I really like that. Mm -hmm. but, um, uh, so I've been grabbing that data um, every minute. Um, this page, when you load the web app, shows uh, the most recently added stations. The last station was added, like Sean said, in October 29. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, this was, this was actually really fun to watch uh, in the last days of October when they were adding a lot of stations. Um, if you go, there's also a list. Uh, yeah, we'll see if it loads. Um, hopefully it will load. I'll talk while we're waiting for it. Um, so right now it's, 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 it's trying to load three graphs. And the reason why it's so slow is because I don't have any data that's cached. So it's lo looking at the last 30 days of data. Hey, and I loaded. Um, and uh, kind of visualizations of that. Uh, I think this top one is the most interesting. These are just weekdays, but it shows the percentiles of uh, how bikes are available. And I actually created this because I have a coworker who started commuting by Divi, and he was frustrated with finding the docks that are empty and wanted to figure out how early he would have to get off to make sure he'd be able to get a bike. Uh, so this darker line in the middle shows the median number of bikes that are available at various times of day. 
Uh, the formatting is not great, but it starts out at midnight and goes until the next midnight. So um, <coughs> this is at Lincoln and Fullerton, so it's, it is, so it's a residential one. So um, I'm actually a little surprised at this, because normally what you expect to see is uh, a lot more dips, like around rush hours. People are picking up bikes uh, in order to commute to work, and that's seen a whole lot with that. Uh, but as you can see, like the median number of bikes changes. It tags a little in the morning, uh, presumably because of commuters, and it goes up a little in the evening. And then the lighter shaded areas are various percentiles. I think it goes to 75th percentile, 85th, and then 90th. So you can get an idea um, not only of how many bikes are available, but how much does that vary day to day. So is this for all time since it was started? Uh, this is just 30 days of data. Which that's like 40,000 data points, give or take. The reason why it's so slow is because it's pulling back 40,000 rows from the database. Um, I'm working on caching that uh, as we speak. Uh, the next two charts are much simpler. They're just um, plots of the, the uh, availability over time. Um, these are really interesting to watch as the new stations spin up because you can start to see, like, oh, they filled up a dock with uh, some bikes, and here's the first person who checked out a bike there. Um, sometimes you can see events that occur as well. Uh, it's difficult to see here because this is 30 days of data, and I don't have a zooming capability, but sometimes when there's an event and a bunch of people are taking bike points, uh, you can spot that there. Um, available docks, as you would expect, is exactly the inverse of available bikes, um, except for those <coughs> instances where they've added you know, uh, uh, capacity to a uh, station. You said your friend wanted to know about when to go outside to the grab bike. Correct. Kind of like a bus track when the bus can be Exactly. Moving, so you should be at this time. So as he, as he or she started using them, uh, no, because um, he liked biking enough that he just went out on the But one, one, so I have a bunch, I have a pretty long to do list for this. I need to change the name, I need to work on the performance. Um, um, obviously, uh, I'm excited about, well, I know you're probably going to talk about this later, but I know you announced the third usage data. Incorporating that um, could be really interesting. Uh, I'd like to have a graph similar to these with the usage data and include um, some external data sources. Like, it'd be interesting to see how the weather affects the use, for instance. And what, uh, what code or what libraries are you using to cover this? Um, this, uh, the, the back end is all written in Clojure. Um, and I'm, I'm using Flot. It looks very Flottish, <laughs> which is a JavaScript charting library to do all the front end. Um, I would love help with the UI parts of this. And if you're interested in helping, um, but you don't know Clojure, which most people don't, um, I would love to work with you to get you up and running. You don't need to learn Clojure to work on the front end of it. The two um, paths are fairly modular. Um, so come talk to me if you want to work on that. Um, and I've tried to lay out the project so it's very easy for somebody to just get it up and running without a whole lot of work. All you need to do is install Postgres and another uh, couple scripts, and you should be able to run this locally. Thank you. Um, so Dave Bragg was created by Alex Sobel, who is in Chile right now because he got a grant from the Chilean government to do a startup. Uh, so he said he's watching on the live stream. <laughs> but um, so Lynn Garnot is going to demonstrate Dave Bragg's. Uh, she was not involved in creating it, but she's uh, an enthusiastic user of Dave Bragg's. <laughs> Um, so Divi Brags is a Chrome extension. Um, so when you, when you go to Divi Brags, it, you know, it tells you right there how to use it. You go to the Chrome store, add to Chrome, and then okay. Now let's tell me how Divi Brags works. All right. So Divi Brags is about making people jealous about how much you buy. 
Um, or in my case, it motivates me to keep biking through the winter. It is a way to calculate your total mileage on duty bikes and a little bit of like full time biking. Um, so, in order to get the total, uh, so all you have to do is download the Chrome extension and then go to your trips page in your Divi account. Um, without the Chrome extension, you'll just get this chart down here which has the information that comes from those Divi stations. Of where you started, where you ended, and the duration of it. Um, so what the Zigibrax app does, and it takes <coughs> in the prescribed end station, puts it in the wonderful giant matrix of distances between stations, and gives you a distance for every trip you take. So each of these, um, that you can get as either CSC. And then it compiles that into the chart. And so this is your day by day biking distance totals. And it's accumulative. Right. So this yeah, this is what Divi gives you on your trips account, and then the last column is what the Divi Brags calculated as the approximate mileage which I believe for the when possible is counted on calculated by biking distance. Google Maps takes this way. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, you know, going the right way down one way street's not. Everyone can ride the Divi does. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, this is. A, and, yeah, and we always wear helmets. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, So, yeah, this is a way you can just see each individual line and trip. And then what Divi Brands does is that visualization where it takes all this information and gives you um, the blue lines are day by day mileage counts. So you can see, for example, um, I biked a lot. There were a couple weekends where I like took the Divi down Lakeshore and went crazy. And then winter hit and I stopped biking every day. Nice. You did 17.4 miles. So there's one day where I think the station I used got moved to Hyde Park. <laughs> <laughs> it thinks so that I biked from Hyde Park up to like Bucktown, but it didn't do. So I think that might be the day where it gave me an extra like six miles. But the other ones are real. I really did do like so miles to take some more. We had a thing if you moved the dock, if you moved the dock to the station, it actually kept the real station. <laughs> so we figured out we had to make sure it transfers to the station. That's probably um, yeah. yeah. So, so thanks to Divi, <laughs> my stats are slightly better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then this, the orange line is the trend of your total miles over time. So this is Divi Bragg's version two, and so as Elliot said, the first version, uh, you would log in to Divi Bragg's with your Divi information, and then Divi Bragg's would log in to DiviBikes.com on your behalf. That's where like the security issues come into play. So the workaround, well it's not even a workaround, it's a completely new system, is to use an extension where Chrome is just reading this HTML table from your screen. So it, it has no communication with Divi server whatsoever. It's just reading this, this chart, this, I mean sorry, this table. Um, the Divi server sent it to your screen and then locally the Chrome extension pulled it out of your screen and put all that stuff. Um, <coughs> So the first version, since it was uh, it was collecting everybody's information, it was able to make a leaderboard, and that was <laughs> like it only lasted for like two weeks. It was really awesome, and like and it made people like really excited <laughs> for uh, a very short time. Um, this one still has the leaderboard. It does. So all you have to you go up and click calculate my mileage, uh -huh. and that will tell you. So it just says 164 out of 164 trips calculated. You should be able to upload that data okay. straight to the Okay, so when I, when I use this on my computer and you click calculate your mileage, it says, oh, you biked 238 miles. And mm -hmm. then I did this earlier today, so I hope I know. Um, just missed all the earlier today. And then after, huh, okay, well, I'm gonna, after you do that, there's a, a button. And it shows you the leaderboard, and so it shows you out of all the people who use this version of Divi Brags, where you rank, and including their mileages. And it gives you a tweet button, right? Yeah, and then you can 
you can either brag to the leaderboard, which is in the extension, or you can it like formulates a, a tweet for you. So maybe my computer has a bug, mm -hmm. and but this. If anyone wants to see it afterwards, I'd be happy to show you. I believe this is a uh, Alex's. It's an open source project. So if you have experience with JavaScript or HTML. That's really all you need because your Chrome extension he's already built. It's really just a JavaScript that it um, uses to calculate data. So what number are you in the leaderboard? Um, well, I'm 17 and 19 because I used it when he was still working out some bugs. So my name's on the list, but yeah, I think I'm 17. The top person has like 1,400 miles. Yeah. No, it's in yeah. base. I think too. Uh, he's, he's, he does our citing, and he insists on writing everywhere on a Divi bike, even though we tell him public transportation is sometimes quicker. <laughs> <laughs> Early on, it was actually Scott Googley, who yeah. was the deputy commissioner of CDOT, who worked with these two guys to basically launch the whole thing. And he obsessively rode to every station to make sure that they were working. Um, and so he had like crazy mileage. So if you think that you're a bureaucrat that's not you're wrong. <laughs> I think the top person is like 500 miles above the second person. But if you guys have backed a lot, get on it and get on the leaderboard. <laughs> Tell me my average speed. Yeah. It does not, although so I use. Here. Yeah, I downloaded my CSV and made an extra column to give me my average speed. And that's actually how I discovered that. The Hyde Park Air came up because it told me that I was biking like 35 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and all my other trips were like, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, this is open source, so what you could do is go to the is GitHub repo for this fork it and add in the mm -hmm. add in the speed. Right. So this is it. It's just HTML JavaScript. Um, uh, okay, thank you, Lynn. Yeah. Um, uh, Eric Potash did not make it, um, so I'm going to show off his um, visualization. So we already showed this map. This is the the blue markers indicate existing stations, and the green markers are people are suggested locations for stations. Um, and if you zoom out like all the way to the world, which I'm not going to do because it's going to take too long, you'll see that people put suggestions like all around the world. Uh, <laughs> but they already talked about what they're going to do about that. Um, so Eric uh, made a visualization, a heat map, um, that every time you refresh it, it does this animation because it's going into the API of the suggestion system, which is also open source and just completely out there, and just pulls in the latest data every single time. Um, so now we can see. So heat maps are, when you look at them like this, it's, it's meaningless. So you just need to zoom in a few more levels, and you start showing, like, OK, the activity spot is over there in uh, Grant Park near Randolph Street, but then there's also an activity spot at North and Ashland, and over here in Logan Square. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and like Logan Square needs more bikes. And so this is, uh, I also made a suggestion um, browsing website. And so this just lists them all uh, by popularity. So you can see that number one is has 108 supports, and it is over Clark in um, Andersonville. And what I, one reason why I did this is because you could type in a word, and you could see how many uh, suggestions add that word. And so 71 out of 285 include the word CTA. Um, and you can type in blue line. And so this takes a while because it's, it's all running this. Uh, the browser is running the calculations. So it has to count all the ones that have been hidden away and the ones that are still showing. Um, and so I was doing this um, 
every couple of hours, I was pulling in the latest data set so that I could track the popularity of different locations. And um, Logan Square was kind of in the lead for like the first few days, but then it kind of dropped off, and somehow this one in Andersonville just shot up. But then also this one, Lower Randolph and DuSable Harbor, is also really popular. And to me, that doesn't seem like a place where a lot of people would want to bike to because you have to own a yacht or a boarding <laughs> one to use that <laughs> station. Um, although it does seem like a decent uh, waypoint on a longer journey uh, if you are a dock surfer. <coughs> um, yeah, so this was just a tool for me to to see what people were, where people were suggesting. Um, and then since I'm a transportation reporter, I, I made a blog post saying, like, oh, this is a map is available for your input. And I just wanted to say, like, hey, guys, these are the top five. Like, maybe if you don't want them to be the top five, you go start suggesting your own and, and popularizing some. Uh, there is no downvote option, so you just got to upvote. Um, okay, so we have one more. Uh, Josh, um, this one's a little different. It's it's a piece of hardware, um, and it's really small. So let's just pull it up. <laughs> okay. Um, hi, I'm Josh. Um, what I've got is a little hardware appliance that connects to the Diddy Bike Safe Yacht. Um, scooch around. There we go. And so this little guy is just an analog gauge. Um, it's green on one side and red on the other. Maybe it's bigger. Oh, okay. Shoot. Take the glare off it. So I'm going to launch the app on my machine right now. And I'm going to select the duty station that's closest to my house and tell it to start watching that station. So you can see it flip up. Um, so now I can leave this guy on my desk. And what it's going to do is continuously update and show me how many bikes are at the station closest to my house, closest to my work. Um, this guy's a prototype for a Wi-Fi based model that will be kind of like a nice wooden CNC enclosure. Um, button on the back so you can switch between uh, a train, <coughs> bus, and video so you can continuously see uh, where you want to be. And the idea behind it is it's not pointing to a number, you know, the number of available bikes, of available bikes in the minimum. It's always changing. Um, so it's just something that's kind of gestural, you know, that you glance down at and you go, oh, okay, there's you know, a good amount or a good chance that I'm going to get a new bike today or in the next few minutes until it updates. And what code base are you using? Uh, this is all Objective C right now, uh, just running locally on my Mac. But the idea would be to open source the hardware along with the software and have a plugin based um, web process. So anyone can submit a new plugin and you can install basically an app on this little gauge and flick through it. So you know, it might be PC bike sharing program, or I don't want trains, I just want buses, and I want three buses to track with this guy. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna try to make it really trip, cheap, free in production, and you know, maybe have three or four on your desk, which is what I do. It's great. You can see all the buses, all the trains, and Diddy all at the same time just by pointing down. I'm gonna make a whole wall. Yeah, no, <laughs> <laughs> so we are we are prototyping a giant wall no, if it's Wi-Fi, so you're right on the bike. So we're right on the bike. We're right on the bike. <laughs> the other thing about it is it does have a personality. So if there's very few bikes, or only a few minutes until okay. your train yeah. bus comes, um, it will shake and get nervous, kind of at the lower end of the gauge. Or right now, it's on the, the train tracker mode. If it's more than 10 minutes out, it gets bored and walks around. So. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now we're going to go back to Elliot and Sean for the, the reveal. <laughs> so last week I said we're going to have a special announcement. Um, Who doesn't know the announcement? Okay. So um, today, this morning, we launched all of our 2013 trip data. Um, and we're making it available publicly at dailybikes.com uh, slash data challenge. And we turn it into a contest and we want to, we know that a lot of you, a lot of people out there will just 
want to tinker with the data themselves, they would do it anyway, but we thought we'd make it fun, um, make a contest out of it. The award prizes for the most beautiful, uh, what are the categories again? The best overall, the most beautiful, most comprehensive, most insightful, most creative. Um, those are sort of things that we're looking for. Um, and basically, all of the trip data, you'll download an Excel file. It'll include, as listed here, the start date and time, the end date and time, uh, the bike ID, actually that's not on there, start station, end station, what rider type they are. So we have members, people who pay that $75 for membership, and also people who just get a 24-hour pass at the station. And if they are a member, we also include their year of birth and their gender. Although the year of birth, uh, in some cases, is off. I think there are reports that one person is 107 years old. Um, <laughs> I mean, it was it's self-reported year of birth. So. It's self-reported, yeah. So I think they typed in 1906. Did you see this? This was made already today at like noon or two o'clock. I did see that. Yeah. This is already there have been two uh, two people ready to go, started already today, um, <laughs> using the data. Um, and so this one shows the age. Yeah, the average age is 34. And then this one shows the gender distribution. Hello. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. So this is um, not totally surprising. You see that in other cities with bike share that is used heavily male. Uh, here's another gender. So that's, that's daily rise <coughs> for members uh, so, of gender. So yeah, in terms of trips, the trips, at least in 2013, were 80% male and 20% female. The members themselves are actually 69% male, 31% female. Uh, but you know, this is the early days of bike share, and we hope to keep any of this out. So basically, you come here, download the data. Um, basically, what we're looking for are infographics, animations, and interactive websites, whatever people are interested in exploring, uh, whatever questions that you have that you want to um, answer. Here's some examples from Hubway, which is our sister bike share in Boston. They did this last year. Here's one example of, I think this was the winner for the most extensive narrative. And you can see there's a lot going on there. But, uh, you know, we're looking at things like this, or even simple things. Maybe it's just one specific question you want to answer and just one map that you uh, create. The way you think about these projects is the products could either be things that help people understand the system. That was a good example of that one. But things, I'm saying things, it could be an app, it could be a visualization, it could be a poem, whatever. Uh, things that help these guys run the system better, and we've already seen a few examples of that. So if any of you are good at predictions, and you you, then that would be helpful. Or also things that help users use the system. Right? So those are three buckets you can kind of use to, to think about this. Or, or things that are just really cool. Or things that are really cool. There was an animation of London uh, Park the Cycle Hire that yeah. I saw probably six months or a year ago. It's just really cool to, it, to watch all the trips. And, I mean, you can literally, it's mesmerizing. It's like a spirograph, watching it kind of float. And so <laughs> things like that that are just cool. That's, that's also something we're interested in. So there's uh, 759,000 individual trips. They're all anonymized. Um, so there's a lot to play with. So it's everything from uh, June 28th to December 31st. Um, did you want to point out something about the like the Boston Latin School students? Or no, these school? were just these okay. just just more particular examples, just examples yeah. of what people did um, in other systems, just to give sort of a sense of you know what you might do. So why is this data a big deal, and how is it different from from the other data? I'm glad you asked. And then I can give you a good explanation. So remember this, this, this kind of heartbeat data? So for every station, we have a row in a spreadsheet, and each row, each row is a station, and it tells you the number of bytes. And that, that whole spreadsheet updates every minute. That's what this stuff is. What this is is basically a spreadsheet where you're going to have the each row is a trip from A to B. And so uh, this column is going to be A station. This column is going to be B station. It's going to tell you how long it took. So basically the same data is powering Diddy Brags. Um, so think about this bike takes off, and now it's riding. It's my awesome bike. <laughs> it's a pretty good bike, right? Uh, it's riding. So when this happens a minute later, this all of a sudden goes down to zero. Uh, 
but here it starts to register the trip. So it's like, oh, it started A, and then eventually it passes and it gets to B. This is, this, is a, this is a trip right here, and then this is an independent station, which all of a sudden that next minute would now have one out of three. So the reason this is so powerful is that it lets us understand the kind of network properties of the system, whereas before we just all we saw is like blindly how many bytes were at each station at any given time. We didn't understand flow. And it's, it's called the bike share network for, for, nothing, for, for a reason, right? So flow is really important. Um, so that's kind of how these things are, are different. <coughs> yeah. uh, I have a question about the time, by the way. Um, uh, so you said the chips are anonymous, or the, the riders are anonymous. But can you see, say, that like a 50-year-old man started here at this station A and then station B? Is that worth that way? Yeah. So it's, it's just anonymous in the sense that uh, you, you can't tell who the person is. But if, if it's a right. member trip, say you took a trip, um, you would know, say, a male who's X age took it from this station to that station. And it's all in one line. So each trip is a single trip. So this is you want to pull it up, actually? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, oh, it's okay. <laughs> oh, okay. So I just want to smoke it. Just so we can look So then, uh, do you have the data in there as to when that person became a member? So you could look at, like, in the trajectory of their membership when they were most active? Yeah, so that's one piece that's missing is we, we don't include that. And actually, you can't track an individual member. Um, you can't be like, oh, member 2947 took this many trips. It's all just trips and who the person is, but not as a unit, unique okay. identifier. You can just There's probably like a tech, or like, how would you describe yeah, it? That's it. Yeah, you can identify it. Yeah. You might be able to assume if the same person, if the same age rider starts at the same station yeah. at the same time every day and ends at the same station at the same time. Yeah, so only that, 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 that 106 year old age rider. Right? <laughs> Try to reverse engineer this. Because the theory of giving us this much information is that it's okay to give us age and, and gender because we can't personally identify who's writing. But if you figure out a way to, to do it, you should tell them. So that could be a project in itself, which is figuring out how private is the state about. To me, it seems pretty private, but that, that could be a project. In Boston, they did that, where they gave, I think, they gave like three years worth of data to MIT students and software computers and using this. Um, and in Minneapolis had that issue as well. They released a little too much data. Oh, really? Yeah. And in, in Boston, they weren't able to determine who it was. <laughs> well, that's MIT. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do they know? Um, here's uh, one example of taking the trip data. So you select a this is in Washington D.C. You select a station. So this one's near uh, Reagan National Airport, and and it draws these lines. And the thickness of the line denotes the popularity of that specific trip. So between station at 18th Meads. Most trips end up at 12th and Hayes or South Georgia and Army Navy Drive. And I know we all know exactly where those are. <laughs> um, so now with this data that Divi has just released, you could build the same, or you could build something completely different. And so that's what the, the hack pad that it started is a lot of examples of people in New York. Well, actually, not New York, because New York has not released this data. But Washington, D.C., <coughs> Boston, and Minneapolis have created and then gave your, made this chart, and another person made this chart. So in three hours or whatever, people are already champing at the bit to, to see what they can make with this data. Yeah, I was actually, I was surprised by how much people are still mining in December. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, like, really? <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a lot. Also, like, the variability is really intense. And the mail bit ridership is way more variable than the mail ridership, which I guess so, is impressive. I think this variability is, um, since these are all member trips, right? Yeah. So that's members right. typically take, off, take a lot of their trips during the weekdays when right. they're commuting, and then the weekends is. That's right. Exactly. But, but like, email. Is not as variable as it. So what are we looking at here? Are these the number of trips per day? Well, per, per day. Per day. Mm -hmm. So this is a week right here, and then like that goes up and then goes down. Yeah. Another thing to consider is on the form that you submit your gender, male is listed first. 
few milliseconds. Mm -hmm. And it's also, I was trying to figure my own profile. Mail is, like, it's, it's shown first. So chances are, like, I mean, it's possible well, somebody just puts the first thing they see. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. someone who makes a lot of web forms will oftentimes <laughs> just yeah. check the first thing. <clears throat> So that's something that could be dirty in the data yeah. in some way. It was uh, mentioned earlier that you said like 10 or 11 people or no more have been like scraping like minutes. Yes. Is that, is anybody like sharing it? I mean, is that so like yes, Ian Dees, who's not here, he has it. Um, yeah. And so we downloaded it, it's like 175 megabytes. Um, okay, so here it is. Oh, so now, well, so he, he this is, it takes a while for him to put it together. Uh, and so the first one is 175 megs, and it unzips to two gigs. One text, or no, actually, it's like thousands of text files. One for every station for every day, I think. Um, so 300 times the number of days of last. Um, and then he just issued a new one today in anticipation of this. Uh, challenge um, by sharing data about hackpad.com. Yeah. And then it's called Chicago Data and Experiences. Um, you'll find, so I, I created this website like six months ago, and I put every single link that I can possibly find about bike share data around the world. Um, okay, so now we got questions and answers at that. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's something actually that we have come up with some metrics for and gets reported on a, just on a monthly basis by Divi to the city. It's one of our reporting things to look at greenhouse gas emissions avoided and things like that. Um, so, what's that? Calories burned. And calories burned, right. Um, but the health department, as far as we know, the health department hasn't, well, the health department has not requested that data from me. Um, so I don't think they're looking at it right now. Are there GIS in it? No, I mean, no one has requested the data from me at this point. We'd certainly share it with them. Yeah. We'd love to share it, but. Has it been uh, no. No. You know, we talked about that. We actually uh, worked with, or we originally had a discussion with uh, some researcher, a researcher who used to be Arizona State, I think, and is now at Notre Dame. And we looked at that. The problem was um, the sensor that they wanted to install needed external power. Mm -hmm. And our stations are modular and so solar powered. We don't have any extra power to give them. And we weren't running infrastructure to them because they're all cellular and solar. Um, so we weren't able to do that ultimately. We actually have a, a hardware designer here, Rob, uh, and partner. They have developed such a device that would track a lot of different things about the sure, climate. <clears throat> air quality, varying speed. Awesome. Well, you know how to get hold of us. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, what's the deadline? Deadline is March 11th. Good month. Yeah. How frequently are you planning to update the uh, usage data? It's a good question. Um, we haven't decided yet. Uh, other systems sometimes do it quarterly, but you know whatever. I guess we're open to feedback in terms of how often you want to see it. How much yeah. time does it take to package it together? Uh, not too much time at all. Yeah, probably as often. We can't do it every day, but we would. We do it every month. Every yeah. month or quarter, we probably would be the fastest. It's a sample, right? Sample, no. It's all good. Yeah. Yeah. All good. Yeah. 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 Y
especially if you want really good predictions, you should make uh, the trips available in real time. So the second someone takes out a bike, you yeah. should be able to know. Because what that will tell you is, um, and, and if for certain people, <coughs> you provided the, the person, then you could come up with a really fancy algorithm that would say, oh, not only you know do these flows tend to happen from this time to this station, to this station where it's this hot, but so and so is writing, which means that they're likely to go there, and so you can get really good predictions that way. I mean, that's a bigger ways down the road, but that's one reason you might want to do it in real time. I just had a general question about integrating DB by share stations with public transit stops. So, for instance, if you wanted to take a trip on a bus and then get on DB, how you could have an app that could tell you how to get from point A to point B using that transportation option? Yeah. So, one of my goals is to have this all integrated with Google. Um, I mean, be anyone, but a lot of people use Google Maps. And that's sort of, I think, the sign that like, bike share is actually a legitimate form of transit is that it's mainstream in that way. That's my personal opinion. But it's one of the things that I'd like to see happen. Uh, they haven't done it for any other city yet, but we are chatting with them and seeing, you know, they have other problems going on, but ideally we'd like to do that. And I'm, so I'm, another hat I wear is travel demand management, and one of the things I want to do is actually an app that would do that, integrate all the basic <coughs> transit options into one place where you can also set a profile as to what your preferences are in safety, speed of travel, costs, and all those things, sliders or however you want to do it. But And then you could basically use your phone, geolocate, and say, I want to get here, but you can get the, all your options in your priority <coughs> order. And I no one's created that yet, but that's kind of, that's my dream, and that's, I may have some money to throw at it at some point this year, but that's. I think Open Plans has made something similar to that. There are pieces of it. Open Planner has yeah. all, basically all the raw pieces that you want to be able to look at. Um, I mean, we actually tried to we set up a winter planner instance here for Chicago, but they kind of lost momentum on it because you can't be Google, right? So yeah. it's like it's hard to it's hard to be that big in something like that. So I mean, what makes what makes sense to me is uh, I mean, getting all the train data in the Google Maps was an initiative that was started by I believe the Portland TriMet in Portland, yeah. Oregon, to get to develop the standard the uh, GTFS they call it, so Google Transit. Standard. Uh, and then eventually everybody sort of decided to release all their data. If you want your, if you want, it was pretty much like Google said, put your data in this format, we'll suck it up, and we'll add it to the maps, and all of a sudden all these other, you know, transit authorities started adding the data. So it seems like since Alta and Divi are sort of in this space as a big player, you guys could lead the way in developing the standards, and, and that would be a way to pass the rules. Yeah, I think that I'm from Portland. The Portland tool actually has um, integration with your own personal bicycle, so like, we don't have bike share yet in Portland. But, um, but I did have one more question, if I may. Um, so in terms of your demographic data, I'm a member of Divi, but I don't think you asked any questions with regard to race or household income. Uh, do you ask those questions of your membership writers? And um, if not, would you consider Requesting that information, and if you did, would you release it? Uh, so we don't currently. We probably wouldn't add it to the form just because people abandon forms the more questions they're asked. But we do do <coughs> an annual survey, which we actually just completed a couple weeks ago, and that was included in that. Uh, we haven't published the results of that yet, but I think it's. We will be soon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and it did. It, it requested all that. It, it also did some interesting things, finding about, because we were interested, Divi's interested in some different pricing and maybe options to be able to offer more options. So maybe a monthly membership where you pay a certain amount, of 5 or $10 a month for a membership. <coughs> um, and we at the city were really interested in why do you take your bike, you know, why do you take, why do you ride where you ride, either on Divi or your own personal bike? What type of infrastructure would actually compel you to ride more? Those sorts of things. So we combined our efforts and put a survey out to all the Divi members. Went out to about 9,000 uh, members three weeks ago, two weeks yeah. ago, um, and so we're we just wading through that data right now. But we got some really good data, and it included those questions. How many members do you have? Uh, 12,000. Okay, so 9,000 responded. 9,000 received it because we only sent it to people who would actually give reason trips. There are some people who haven't. 
Or it's not going to buy brand new. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we got about 2,400 responses. So really pretty good response rate. rate. The birth survey is. Another way to estimate it is you guys have the home address of all numbers. So you can look at census data for the nearby census tract. It will give you at least a rough answer. Good point. Yeah. Could you talk more about what your plans and pricing are and what you've done at this point as far as what it costs to make the new trade? Yeah, so the pricing is $75 per year, $7 for our pass. And that pricing was basically based on what other bike share do. We sort of use that as the model. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of room to become more sophisticated. It's a, and it's actually so it's so unsophisticated that it's set in the contract. So okay. the contract with the city to Alta says these are the prices you're going to charge. Yeah. And, but it also allows for flexibility and approval on the city's part and working together to come up with a different pricing model um, if, if we want to. So that's what the be possible. It could be. I think at this point it's not with the software that we currently operate the system on. I don't think we could dynamically price, but we could potentially. Yeah. For this year, really, we're not, we don't have plans to increase prices or really change it considerably. But like Sean said, we want to offer the best options. So for example, right now, if you remember, you get the first 30 minutes of your trip included in your membership. Some people say, you know, I want that extended to 45 or 60 minutes. So we could possibly see a, a world in which you pay $75, like now, for 30 minutes of every trip free. Um, and maybe you pay, you know, ninety or ninety-five dollars for forty-five minutes. Mm -hmm. And so that was what was in the survey. Yes, Steve, Steve wrote about this. Um, you know, some people have said that they're actually willing to pay, you know, twenty dollars more a year to have that peace of mind or to be able to travel a little bit further. Or conversely, as Stephen knows, the the holy grail in bike share is the unbanked people who don't have bank accounts. And no one that in, no one nationally or internationally has figured out how to do that. But one way is to have pricing models that actually provide some flexibility where people who can't maybe afford to do first of all, there's do people have a credit or debit card? We recognize that's an issue. We're working on that. There's community partnerships and other ideas that we can do um, to kind of take on the main reason for that is is liability. The bike costs twelve hundred dollars to replace and it does actually cost us twelve hundred dollars to replace the bike. We're not Gouging, that is what it costs um, to get a new bike. But to take on that liability, so we're looking at that, but also offering more flexible pricing <coughs> models for people who can't afford $75 all at once is something we're also interested in. They said there's 30 minutes is included in every trip for members. Um, and you said, and I took the survey, and probably several people here also did the survey, and one of the choices like, would you pay a different price to get 45 minutes? And so. One thing that's interesting about Lynn's data here is that you look at the uh, the average distance, and it's only 1.7 miles. Mm -hmm. Which, and then if you look at the average duration, it's well, I think the average was broken down into minutes and seconds, but it's probably somewhere around like 15 minutes. Yeah, and that is basically nationally congruent. Most people's trips are less than two miles uh, by bike, by car, by walking, by any mode. Um, so like, I was like, no, I don't want 45 minutes. I don't care if it's costing me one dollar extra a month. I just do not need it ever. Yeah. And it really plays out that way in people's behavior. Well, there's a friction supply that over that. Mm -hmm. right? There's a there's definitely enough force supply to so let me some money to get and save some of them. And then there's I mentioned dock surfing. So you just put a bike in, right, right. wait. Like five seconds and take it the same that way. Out. Easy. Like I love to find a user ID just so we can kind of start trying to track the dots or anything. Yeah, how popular it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows about it? These ones bike ID don't So bike ID you said was in this it is your data. Yeah. So you can <laughs> track a bike so through this system. Like so that's just a bike from mobile. Yeah, you probably do a or how long the bike stays there? The formula that says it's <laughs> <here. laughs> okay. the bike is returned to a station and taken out. <laughs> That'd be a fun one. Like a life of the bike. Yeah. <laughs> I may have to go somewhere else. I mean, who doesn't ask a question? 
Yeah, I had real quick question. It's not really about city bikes exactly, but like as a bicycle rider in the city for a long time, and I've seen Vinny come along in, in other cities, like in having had a really bad accident myself, um, the thing that concerns me is like, well, there's no like home station, you know. Um, yeah. And I see a lot of people like Steve who have their own helmets and bring that with. I'm wondering, like, with the increased number of people on bikes in the street and so on, have you seen how, how what, are you, what are your thoughts about it? On helmets or on, like, safety gear, I guess? And then, has that increased? Uh, have you seen any kind of increase in injuries because people won't have bikes? Or so we, we can only track with the incidents that are reported to us. Yeah. And to date, I think. Eight, seven or eight accidents have been reported to us. Crashes. I'm crashes. sorry, crashes. <laughs> yes, seven or eight crashes. Crashes. One that actually the person had to seek medical treatment. That's um, really so when you think of, yeah, you know, seven hundred fifty thousand trips. I don't know. Eight hundred thousand trips. So. Eight hundred thousand trips. That's point of our life. You know, so bike share riders experience fewer crashes and injuries as of. Or the whole, the Which is not to say that helmets don't matter. Yeah. Um, it's they're not legally required in Chicago, but or in Illinois. Motorcyclists don't need to wear helmets in Illinois, which is debate <laughs> whether or not that's a smart thing too. But the the issue is there just isn't the technology hasn't really been developed. Yeah. Although we are talking to uh, a provider. Yeah, so we we Ellie and I we've been working on this actually over the last couple of weeks. We um, Talk to there's a there's a prototype in Boston called Helmet Hub, which which is actually it was developed by MIT students. It's a helmet vending machine. Uh, you can either sell or rent them, so that that's one option we're looking at. We have a conversation Thursday, I think, with a large uh, company that's everywhere to sell low cost helmets to the public, or at least in areas where. Um, there's a higher concentration of tourists and folks who may not be like Stephen. I keep, I have, helm, I have a helmet at home, and I have a helmet in my office, so I always have a helmet. Although Elliot and I, we walked over here ultimately, but we talked about being over here and not wearing helmets. <laughs> everyone does it occasionally. We don't recommend it. We strongly recommend you wear a helmet. Although there are studies too that show that people, even if they don't wear helmets, if they're more active biking, they are actually live longer and have a healthier lifestyle. So even without the helmet, even if you get in a crash, it's a crash and you're likely to get injured, but longevity and other health statistics are actually better, like either with or without it. Yeah. The other issue is that to the extent that maybe because it makes biking so easy and lets more bike riders, it means each bike rider is on average safer. Yeah. Uh, what um, I guess what is in terms of keeping this system up and running and managed, what's your biggest headache, right? Is it is it bike is it stock outs on bikes at high volume stations? Is it so at the moment, as in today, there are very few issues. What happens in the summer though, when right. everyone starts using? Um, I, I, I at the yeah. moment in the big in the big, in the big yeah. yeah. The hardest thing is um rush hour. So everybody converging downtown at the same time, everybody's leaving at the same time. Uh, there's only so much we can do. We can have more docks, we can have more vans on town. But um, we have a lot of issues with, with isolated um, stations outside of those major downtown stations that have regular stock out problems. Outside of downtown, right Some, sometimes along the blue line, um, <laughs> along the Lake Montreal, some of the ones at the harbors, yeah. um, especially but, on weekends in the summer, like if it's a beautiful day, uh, people will have to form a line to wait for a bike to be returned or just to use the kiosk, things like that. So uh, I would say, you know, during the weekdays it's rush hour, and during the weekends it's those sort of. Like Lake Montreal, yeah, tour, more, mostly tourists. I mean, and the uh, the usage switches. Two, it's it's on during the week, it's annual members, and on the weekends, it's a daily pass purchasers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can you can actually see the data go up and down like that. Yeah, I was just curious as to what your uh, data 
shows the typical profile of a Gibby writer to be and whether you're uh, doing anything to appeal beyond that demographic. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's what, did you say 69% male, 39% yeah. female? Um, 35%. I think about numbers. This is based on the survey. Oh, not right, right, right. 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 So we, yeah, we in fact just today we are um, we recognize that there are kind of the unbanked issue is part of it, but also there are there are communities where we are serving. So we it, it's a city service, it's a transit system. We're putting stations everywhere um, equally on both the north and south side and the west side. We're growing, we're actually growing in all directions fairly equally this year too. Um, but we are so we're working on a bunch of different strategies. We're just recently wrapped up a number of meetings with community groups, figuring out partnerships in those communities to actually promote Divi to people who live in Bronzeville or who live in Tilson or who live in other communities where there's good infrastructure, there's good transit, there's Divi, but there's less use than we'd like to see. But we're figuring it out. I was, I was thinking yeah. more uh, specifically in the areas that you're already in. For instance, I live in Logan Square. And I've encouraged people my age to um, use Divi, and they looked and they're like, oh, that's not me. You know? <laughs> so that's what I meant about the healing beyond that graphic, uh, the graphic that I think it really is. Yeah, I mean, we certainly recognize that it's all about education and get, you know, it's it's a challenge. I mean, I, I bike to work on my own bike most every day, not right now because it's too cold, but um, I ride home. To, I live in Lincoln Square and I ride home to, with uh, an attorney who also works for the city. And I, I ride home with him probably once, you know, once or twice a month. And every time we have this conversation about why he should join Divi. And he, he's biking too on his own bike. And he goes to meetings throughout the city and downtown. But I, I still haven't convinced him. So I, re I recognize, and this is me, the manager of Divi trying to con at the city, trying to convince someone else who works for the city to do it. So um, it's it's definitely a challenge that we're trying to get around. And LA, you can probably talk about this from a marketing perspective. Too. Yeah, I mean, I guess it depends what you mean. You're talking about ethnicity or age or gender. We're all the yeah, we're we're doing uh, not so much age. I guess we haven't really thought of that from that lens. But we also did three lovers. That's right. Three lovers. Yeah, that you told me. Both late. Both yeah. Both yeah. Both yeah. Both yeah. Both yeah. Both yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like for, for the gender thing, and which came up earlier, uh, you know, we'd like to see that more balance. And so we're planning to do Women's Bike Month, which actually doesn't exist, but Divi wants to host it. So any women or any other people who would like to have ideas about what we can do, like events, um, to get people excited about biking, that's something we plan to do in June. So things like that, um, you know, we can't appeal to everybody, but we're certainly cognizant. We were just talking about something you said that you want to get on Google so that people can, you know, plan a trip using your infrastructure as well. Yeah. Um, one of you was like, I would love to be able to use that in my venture card and like tablet or something like that. Have you guys thought about ideas like that, or you have one pass? Yes, we have, and right now the technology isn't there on the back end. I believe is the challenge. Um, we, we've talked about that. So right now, all the systems that Alta operates throughout the country don't necessarily work with each other. So we'd like, and part of that is actually technology, but part of it is also revenue sharing. So if I, as a Divi member, go to DC and want to use Capital Bike Share, even if it did work, who gets the money from when I use Capital Bike Share? So we're working on that as a question. And the, the same question works or comes up with Ventra, but then also the technology is not there yet. That could be crazy data, though. We could actually see people moving. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it would be really see. great, actually. Yeah. That's and it's something long term, it's one of our goals to implement to work with CTA to get Ventra and to be working together, but it's just not there. Yeah, not too much from like the behavioral decision mm -hmm. making point. $7 a month tag on is just a $70 a year or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a small fraction of the total monthly amount. So it's very easy to just say, oh, yeah, for an extra seven bucks, right. I'd like that option. Right. So it's uh, almost eight. 
so I think maybe can you can you guys stick around for a little bit? Yeah, we'll stick okay. around. Okay. We brought free 24 hour passes to a few guys. Anyone wants to come up? Right. Awesome. No, thank you guys very much. Sure.